much more treachery and this is not going to be good. All right. Well, welcome to church on this Sunday evening. As no, we stopped recognizing birthdays a long time ago. Do you know what a birthday is? Yeah. An- <laughs> Today? <laughs> it's another day. It's, that's all it is. It's another day. And, uh, and we, just, we just move on past it, right? Because what does it matter? Hey, as long as I wake up in the morning, thank the Lord, I can keep on going. But, um, but it, it's been a, been a worthwhile. I got a nap today. And typically that would be a bad thing for y'all. But I'm not preaching. So, but, uh, but I'm glad, glad you all found your way back to church this evening. Let's all start by uh, tra- taking our, our hymn books. Why don't you stand with us if you can. Here, turn to hymn 399, Higher Ground. The song the choir just... Uh, The second song the choir sang to open with, and uh, let's sing this together as we open up our evening service. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on high. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll move forward with the service. And Brother Ed Armstrong, would you open us, please, sir? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful that we have got a day set aside for you. Call a holy day, a special day, dear God, for you. A day of rest. And dear God, we're thankful that our son Jesus has came, lived among us, and died for us, and gave us life Amen. Hey, you may be seated. Uh, if you're born in this month, though, it could be a bad time because you could be born on the 29th, couldn't you? And uh, you might only be 11 years old, even though you're 44 years old. So uh, that's at least he didn't, uh, he didn't get caught on that. Uh, got closer to George Washington. He was closer around George. Hey, Amen. Happy birthday, Pastor, anyway. Well, a few announcements just to make. The missions conference, Wednesday. Have you all noticed that the days go by quickly? Have you ever thought about that? Brother Austin, how old are you? How old? 
58, yeah, okay. Plus? Well, you realize that 185th of your life is going by this year? But you take a little child over there that's five years old, only one-fifth of their life's going by this year. So it seems like forever for them. But for those of us that have a lot of days go by, it's just that quick, isn't it? He's getting closer. He's working on it. Mission Conference Wednesday. Wednesday will be here. And if you're not careful, you'll come back next Sunday and say, oh, I missed it. Don't do that. 7 o'clock each night, Wednesday through uh, Friday and then Saturday. Of course, it'll be at... At 5.30 for the, for the International Supper, make sure that you're just a part of every bit of that. It'll be a blessing to your heart and life. It's the business meeting of the church for the year. What are we going to do for missions this year? Just use that time in a very special, special way. The last day of the missions conference on Sunday, there'll be two services, but they'll be at the normal time. So just plan on next Sunday. Invite people. Invite people to the missions conference. Had something happen to me, and I need to share this with you just real quick. Like yesterday, I went to dinner with a fella. And he said, I went to Bethel Baptist Church in 1988. And he says, the best thing about Bethel Baptist Church in 1988 was their mission conference. And he made mention of the mission conference and, the, and the, this church here. Let's get it back that way. Amen? Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, how, if you're a Baptist, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're a Baptist. Now, raise your hand if you know how to say Amen. Doesn't hurt to say it, folks. Doesn't hurt to say it at all. When the preacher says something good, amen. You hear me, don't you? I hear Butch. I say amen. I hear Butch say amen. But let's say amen our pastor. Let's, let's encourage him in his preaching. Hey, there you go. Hey, it works every time. Missionary basket items need to be turned in today so they'll be ready for Wednesday. So that's just it. If you got your basket item, get it in. Uh, today, and then we're having a pancake breakfast, or the city of uh, the, the Kiwanis are having a pancake breakfast on the 29th, and seniors would just like to go to that, and uh, we're going to run a bus start, we'll leave here at 8 o'clock in the morning, I have got tickets, they're $5 a piece, and uh, two for 12 if you'd like them, and uh, uh, so just get, get some, and, and uh, plan on going with us, and have a great time, we're going to get a sign-up sheet, it'll be out there, be ready for you, but amen. Let's just have a great time this week. As a, uh, have this pastor's birthday, let's enjoy it. If, even if he doesn't enjoy it, let's enjoy a pastor's birthday. Amen? Yeah, I was thinking that he, he said it's five dollars a piece or, or two for twelve. I thought that's the Baptist bargain right there. <laughs> Amen. That's the way we operate things. You you get an evangelist in here and it gets worse. Trust me. But uh, the yeah, <laughs> the uh, the choir is going to sing for us this time, and uh, people need the Lord. We're of course gearing up. For missions conference looking forward we'll sing this again sunday morning of the missions conference and so let uh, i know you probably heard the song before but let it be an encouragement once again
Amen. Well, it'd be better if I brought my book with me. I'm still getting used to, used to this new routine back and forth. It's getting me, but that's a beautiful song. People do need the Lord. There's a reason why we have a missions conference. There's a reason why we give to the gospel, being able to get around the world, locally and around the world, all at the same time. And uh, people everywhere. By the way, still in America as well. I know America is seen as, oh, America's not a mission field. <laughs> have you looked at it lately? America is actually one of the largest mission fields today. We are quickly becoming like England. It's amazing. We're, we in America are following the same path that England took when it had the gospel. You realize England at one point, it was the central sending point of missions. Some of the most famous and well-known names of missionaries that we know, we read about, we talk about, and we look to as heroes of the faith came out of England. And today, England is more of a witchcraft nation than anything else. It is a nation that has left God for the most part, and America is following suit. We have followed some of the same principles of that nation. Not against, not, nothing against England, but if we're not careful, you can see where we're going. Churches close their doors. The gospel is not all that free to be preached and, and uh, presented and America can find itself in the same place if we're not careful. We are a mission field. So it is still Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. We've got to make sure we have uh, this country also reached as well. And so that's part of our job. That's why we're here. We're not here just to meet together and have a good time in God's house. We're here so we can get charged up and go back out there and have something to tell the lost that we meet on a daily basis as well. Well... Mini message over with. I'm not preaching tonight. I'm starting to feel the effects of it, okay? But um, let's go ahead and sing together one more time as we get ready to, to shake hands. So why don't you stand with us? And we're going to go to hymn 180. Sorry, no, I'm sorry. 553. Hymn 553. Sweet by and by. Hymn 553. You got your hymn book there. I got to get there too. I'm going to catch up one of these days. That nap messed me up big time today. All right. Hymn 553 on the first. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall be. somebody next to you, shake their hand, let them know you're happy to see them this evening.
I was going to go shake hands by the time I got down. I was like, no, might as well not. We've got to sing another verse and get ready to receive the offering. So if you got your hymn book there, why don't you just stay right there, hymn, hymn 553. Let's sing that last verse together. Here we go. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love. And the blessings that hallow our days In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore well, Amen, amen uh, you may be seated. And Brother Taylor, would you lead us in a word of prayer as we take the evening offering, please? Amen. pull up the other bit of the crew. We're going to sing for you before the preaching. Of course, Pastor Smith's going to preach for us tonight. Looking forward to what the Lord's laid on his heart. And um, the, the girls and I are, we're, we're going to, we're bringing one, one up. We, we sang this uh, several weeks ago and uh, folks enjoyed it. And we enjoy singing it. So we're going to do it again. Hope that's okay with you. But um, this, this one, uh, you're about to climb. And it talks about taking a step of faith, which, again, goes right along with where we're heading for Missions Conference, uh, moving faith forward. And so let this be a blessing.
Pastor Dicker got up here just a little while ago, and of course he said, well, I just had my mini sermon there. Well, I'm in my 51st year of preaching the gospel. And every time somebody hands out that little character, this boy, he jumps on it. Because that's just how it is. When God puts on a man's heart to preach the word of God, it's a burning in his heart. And it doesn't go away. Why don't you take your Bibles through the second Peter chapter number one. We're getting ready for our missions conference. Like I've mentioned a couple times today, it's the annual business meeting of the church that we decide what we do, what God wants us to do. Uh, I'm going to mention some things tonight that I can prove that without a shadow of a doubt from the Word of God. The year was 2004, and that's 16 years ago already. And God had broken my heart. I was pastoring a church that was doing very, very good. We had just taken on our 70th missionary at $100 a month. We had uh, just had 250 morning service. God broke my heart about missions. Missionaries would come through the, oh, somebody turned me on. <laughs> Missionaries would come through the uh, our church on uh, furlough, preach, excited about the fact what's going on in their mission field. And then we'd go back to their mission field on a six, five or six months later with a broken heart because while they were gone, the devil had crept in and wrecked the work that they'd worked so hard on the mission field to get going. And God broke my heart about going and just replacing those missionaries that they might have a good pastor there while they were home on furlough reporting to you churches. I opened the door for me to do that. I, I spent time on 10 different mission fields over the next uh, 11 or 12 years. My wife and I did until my health began to waver a little bit. The age started to get a little bit along the line. We had to come back. But he didn't stop the preaching. He didn't stop the birth for missions. Right after I'd been called for missions, I was reading first, I was reading Second Peter one afternoon. And I'm reading these verses, if you have your Bible in front of you at that time, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Every time I read those words and think about the fact back in 1969, somehow by the grace of Almighty God, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, born in the home of a drunk Born in the home of a father that died at 46 years of age of alcoholism. A boy who had never been in church one day in his life. But I went one day because I wanted to be a good father. And God gave me the gospel. I heard it in simple childlike faith. Sitting in a pickup truck. By the way, it was foreordained before the foundation of the world that I should be a pastor in Alabama because I got saved in a pickup truck. <laughs> Foreordained before the foundation of the world. On the side of a road in Denver, Colorado, I bowed my head. Simple childlike faith trusted Christ and got like precious faith. I can never, 51 years later, 50, almost 52 years later, I can't get over it. If you can get over your salvation, we need to talk tonight. If you can get over the fact of what Jesus Christ did for you that day on Calvary's tree, when he shed his precious blood and died in your place, rose again the third day, ready to come again, maybe even tonight before I finish preaching. If you, can't, if you can get over that right now, let me talk to you tonight. Salvation is such a wonderful, glorious thing. We have like precious faith. Well, he goes on. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto the life of God. Did you read what I just read? God has given us everything. Look what he says. Everything pertaining unto life and God in us through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. And then I read this verse. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, but by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
as I was reading that and realizing what God had done for me and praying about the fact that now God had called me to a different field at 62 years of age. I was 62 years old in 2004. And that I was going to leave a great church and leave a great bunch of people. People whom I loved. And people who I think loved me. To go be with the Lord, my heart was heavy. As I'm thinking about missions and then I think about the places God's going to call me to go to and wonder what was going to happen and what we got to do over the next 10 years, I got to pastor two churches in Australia, one in Korea. I got to preach in Beijing, China to a, a, in, a, in closed churches in China. Pastor a church in Argentina, two in Scotland, two in Canada, and one, and one in Ireland, and one in the strangest mission field of all, Southern California. <laughs> God allowed us to do these things over those years. But as I was praying, I got to thinking about what promises does God have for me? What promises does God have for them that are willing to go wherever God calls them to go? What promises does God have for you tonight if you're just willing to go? So I did a strange thing. And some of you ought to practice this once in a while. It'll really work. I began reading my Bible. And as I was reading my Bible, I thought, well, I'm going to just check out the Great Commission. And I was, as I was checking the Great Commission, I want you to go along with me as, as I'm doing this because I want, I want to surprise you all with something tonight. Every single person in this church that is bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and is sitting here tonight has been called to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. Every one of you. Oh, we get this idea of this call of God. For example, me and Pastor Decker are called to preach the gospel. But you're called to tell the gospel, and you can preach to anybody you want anytime you want to. There's nothing special about it. It's just something God has done in our lives, and that's what he's called us to do. But every person is called to be a missionary. By the way, you said something, preacher, that's the truth. A mission field in America, you don't have to go overseas anymore. They've all come here, so if you want to go to a Hindu, find, go to some big city. You can find a bunch of Hindus there. If you, want to, if you want to go to a South African or if you want to go to anybody on this world right now, you don't have to leave the United States of America to go to a mission field to somebody that speaks a different language, somebody that uh, has a different culture, somebody that has a different religion. They're all over the place right now because here's what God is doing. He says, we won't go. He's going to send them to us. And now we're sitting here fat, dumb, and happy in America and not going out and telling them, here. Well, anyway, I'm reading that. That's just a sideline. You know, your preacher never does that. He, got, he kind of picked on me this morning, so not realizing he was going to give me the opportunity here tonight. You know, sometimes, sometimes we don't think things all the way through. Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, says, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he says this to him. Oh, let me add a little footnote here. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, after that he came out of that grave, the next 40 days as he walked upon this earth, guess what the only thing the Bible records he talked about? Go. Read everything you want to read in this book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts. On, the, on Jesus Christ after his resurrection and the only thing he talked to his people about was go. I wonder if it's important to God. I wonder if missions are important to God. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm sitting there in Decatur, Alabama praying reading this, getting ready to go on a, a deputation. By the way, if I could go on deputation again, I'd stay on it 12 years. I love deputation. Got to preach three times a week everywhere, man. It was a great, great time. But anyway, look what it says. Teaching them to observe all things. And then I saw it. I saw the promise. I saw the first promise. I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, 
even unto the end of the world. Amen. If you are willing to go for God, if you are willing to just step out by faith and start talking to people about Jesus Christ, whether it be in Harsel, Alabama, or around the world, if you are just willing to begin to start doing that, he promises that he'll go with you. It's a promise. And my Bible says in Titus 1-2, the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. And he said over in 2 Peter, I give you exceeding great and precious promises. He promises you if you'll just step out. I don't care. And by the way, you guys think, oh, Brother Schmidt came here and I guess we're going to have a great time coming with you. I'll tell you about it. Anybody over 65, you're in trouble. Because the first time you cry to me about you can't do it, I'm going to say, I'm 77 years old and I'm doing it. So it ain't gonna, you're, not, you're not going to cry on this old shoulder. We can serve God any old time. And we can, and we, listen, we can always tell somebody about Jesus. We can all, you say, wait, I don't know what to say. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many of you know how you got saved? Have you ever read the book of Acts? Did you ever look at Paul's sermons? They were just his testimony. That's all Paul did. He went to Agrippa and Festus. He says, guess what happened to me on a Damascus road? I saw a light. God came down and I got saved. And I fell on my face and God said, get up. I've got a job for you to do. And then he said in Acts chapter 26 and verse 26, he says, and I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. See, we're, God's got something. He says, I'll go with you. He says, you'll never be by yourself. He says, I'll go right there and be with you and be by your side. Let me illustrate. It's 1956. Wow. That's a long time ago. I'm 12 years old. My dad was a drunk. He was crippled in World War II. And he drove him to drink. Loved to fish and hunt. He couldn't take his boy Butch fishing. He couldn't take his boy Butch hunting. Because he couldn't walk. But he had a friend named Jim. Jim was in the Air Force, Army Air Corps with my dad. My dad was a B-50, a B-17 gunner, 50 caliber machine gunner. And Jim was half Indian. He called my dad up and said, can I take Butch fishing? Oh, by the way, that's my name too. Butch. He stole it. They still call him Butch. They don't call me Butch anymore, but I was called Butch until I was 20 years old. He says, can I take Butch fishing? And we went up on the Gunnison River in the Black Canyon of the Gunnison in Colorado. One of the premier trout streams in the world. In 1956, there was no four strangers, and there was no signs, and there was no things to pay. It was back when people could be people. You all remember those days? And we went and we hiked. It took us a day to get over. We hiked down those mountains because there were 11,000 feet mountains. And we went down those mountains, and we get down on the Gunnison River, and we fished. I drank my first cup of coffee down, down there. In a, he took a, he had a can he carried with him, and we built a fire, and he just put over, he just put grounds in there, stirred them around there, got boiling, poured in there, says, have your first cup of coffee, Butch. That was my first cup of coffee, and I'm still drinking it this day. Didn't kill me then, didn't kill me now. In fact, I think it's probably uh, the elixir of life. But we got ready to leave and come out of there. And we're walking up there, and I'm a 12-year-old boy, and Jim got ahead of me on the trail. And it was just getting close to dark. I'm sorry, when I move around like that, I get that, get that little thing going. If anyway, I can pin it on my coat. Excuse me, folks. I'm going to unhook myself if I can. It won't cooperate. Huh? Is that better? There we go. We have a way. There is a way. We're going out there at 12 years old. All of a sudden, I can't see Jim anywhere. And we're on the side of this mountain out in the middle of nowhere in Colorado. And I began to weep. And I remember crying. And I remember how lonely I was there. And while I'm crying, all of a sudden, the light shined down on me. I'm looking down, he said, Butch, get up here. And he was with me. He was with me. 
And it was all different when he was with me. And my Lord Jesus says, go, Walt. Wherever you go, I'll go with you. Wherever you are, I'll go with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. He promised in Hebrew 13, 5, did he not? I will never. Wow, what a great promise. But it's only to those that will go. You can't expect the promise just because you go to Walmart. You can't expect the promise just because you get up in the morning. It's a promise to them who are willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. You know how to build and fill this church up? It's not going to get built up by Walt Schmidt and Bobby Decker and our families going out visiting all the time. This church is going to grow and going to build and going to fill up and people are going to start walking this aisle. And people are going to start getting saved and getting baptized in this church the day that you all decide that this is my church and my place and he's my God and he's with me and I can go and he'll do something about it. Because I promise you, if we go, God will bless. It's guaranteed. Go ye into all. Well, man, I, was, I got excited. I'm getting ready to go. And God's going with me. And so I kept going. And I turned over to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 16. And I read again. Oh, it might be right over there on that wall. There it sits. Look what it says here. And he said unto them, verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. Oh, doesn't say that, does it? Baptism has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. You all know that, don't you? Baptism is just an act of obedience that we do because we ought to be obedient. We ought to show what happened to us, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And these signs shall follow them to believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. By the way, that's languages. Yo entiendo español. When I went to Argentina, I had to learn a little Spanish. Well, the first thing I learned Spanish was, Donde esta el baño? <laughs> Where's the bathroom? I mean, you know, that's the first thing I learned in Italian. Dove a gabinete? You know, some things are important. <laughs> and you get them. They speak new languages. They shall take up serpents. Read about anybody taking up serpents in the Bible, in the New Testament? Folks shake their head, yes. Uh-uh, that serpent took up Paul. Paul didn't take up that serpent. He stuck his hand out and the snake came out of the fire and bit him. He didn't take up the serpent. The serpent took him up. Uh-oh. By the way, there's some groups in the New Translations, if you don't have the right translation of the Bible, they cut this out now. This is no longer in the New Translation. Did you know what I'm reading right now? It's no longer in most of the New Translations. They didn't figure it was important. It says, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and they shall drink, drink any deadly thing. Is there anything in the New Testament about anybody drinking any deadly thing? No. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I read that. I was just so blessed in Matthew. I was so excited about the fact he's going with me, and now I'm stuck. I'm reading here, and I'm looking at the context of the scripture, and it's the Great Commission going. And then it dawned upon me, if I go in his name, he'll protect me. He promises protection. He promises when you step out in his name, he'll protect you. He'll not only protect you physically, he'll protect you spiritually. He'll keep your heart life and life right. It's worth it to go, folks, because of the promises of Almighty God. God promises me, he'll never leave me or forsake me. God promises me he'll go with me wherever I may go. Every one of you sitting in this place right now could give me a testimony tonight of sometime God's protected you. Sometime God's done something special in your life that you know God was in it. That you know there's part of it. And that's just for your everyday life. Can you imagine the joy and the peace that comes when you understand when you walk with him, he'll protect you. Folks say, Why, what's the safest place in the, in the world, uh, to be in this world? 
be in the very center of the will of God, which means you're going out to tell others about Jesus. The only reason he came, Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come what? To seek and to save that which was lost. There's no other reason for us to be here. The only thing that we can do that brings glory to God, and God, the pastor talked about that this morning, when we go and tell other people about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm going to go. He's going with me. I'm going to go. He's going to protect me. Got to be something good in Luke. So I turned over to Luke. Luke chapter 24. And I read these words, starting in verse 44. And he said to them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you. Now he's talking after his resurrection. That all things must be filled, fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning us. Then opened up he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise. Oh, there it is. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now he says there's a promise. But what's the promise here in Luke? He's promised me. By the way, I'm alliterating this to so get peace so you can remember. He promised his presence. He promises protection, and he promises provision. He provides everything. What do you need to, when you go? Can anybody answer that for me? Let me tell you what you need when you go. The gospel. That's all he gave him right here. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it in a nutshell, isn't it, folks? That's all we got. And I said, he's provided everything we need. He paid the price. He provided the salvation that we're going to tell people about. I love the message of Sunday ago. I do listen to messages, Pastor. Even though it is tough to sit there when you're a preacher, it's tough to do. But I did, And I love the fact that sometimes I don't need to go out and tell people, hey, folks, heaven's wonderful, got streets of gold. No, gold is nothing in heaven. No, but we got the provision. What do we tell them about the death, the burial of resurrection? Can I scare you to death now? I'm going to tell you something going to blow your mind. We got these love of God preachers all over the place. God loves you. Oh, Jesus loves me. God loves you. I want you to notice, I want you to read the book of Acts this week. I want everybody to read the book of Acts this week. And I want you to come back to me at the end of this week and show me one verse in the book of Acts that says God loves you. You go over with Peter in Acts chapter 2. Oh, God loves you all so very much. I'm glad. No, he says, you crucified the Lord of glory. Is that what, that's what Peter said. What happened? Oh, 3,000 people got saved. Go to Acts chapter number 5. When 5,000 get saved, they stood up and said, You crucified the Lord of glory. How many of you got saved because you want to go to heaven? I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. That's right. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. Heaven's a blessing. But God wants us to understand something. Jesus died, and hell's real. And if we don't tell people, if we don't get them saved, they're going to die and go to hell. And we're going to stand that day on Revelation chapter number 20. We're going to stand that day, and we had the provisions of God in our hand. And there are going to be multitudes that you work with and multitudes that you saw every day. And they're going to look at you and say, why didn't you tell me? You knew the answer. You had the provision. You had exactly what it's needed. And you didn't tell me. Now, there are going to be some that we did tell. And they didn't take it. That's okay. We told them, didn't we? We need to read Ezekiel 3 again. I, I, I went up there today. And I, and I, I looked at the pastor's work. And I came down that stairs and hell like that. And I got dust everywhere all over my whole body. That dust was all over my hands. That's okay. I went in there and my wife washed it off. But I can't wash the blood of somebody that I didn't tell off my hands. 
me tell you a quick story. It's 1972, and I'm running the bus route for Highland Park Baptist Church, Tennessee Temple Schools in East Ridge, Tennessee. It's part of Chattanooga. And every Saturday, we'd go from 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock, knocking on doors, getting people to ride buses. And every Saturday, I'd pick up the, this one dear lady, and there was a fellow right next door to her, and I'd knock on his door every Saturday. Mr. Smith was his name. And I'd knock on Mr. Smith's door, and I'd say, would you come to church with us? Uh, I might, I might. He never would. He never did. He never did. And I went up there one day and I knocked on the door to a lady's house and she said, I'll be there. She rode every Sunday. And I went over and I said, well, I'm going to go over and see Mr. Smith. And she said, oh, he's in the hospital. He's not over there right now. You won't see him. And so I told the dear lady right there when I got home, I said, this week I'm going to go over and see, uh, see Mr. Smith in the hospital. And I didn't. I wasted the week. And I went over the next Saturday and I knocked on the door of the lady and she said, I'll be riding. And I said, and she said, oh, there's no use going over to Mr. Smith. He died this week. And for 50 years now, for 50 years, God brings that back to my mind. You didn't tell him. And you didn't go. And I'll live with that to my grave. And every one of you looking at me right now have that same thing in your life because we keep our mouths shut and one day we're going to stand before a holy and righteous God. And they're going to stand there. And Jesus is going to look at them and say, Angels, take them and cast them into the lake of fire. Where the devil and his angels are. And we're going to be there forever. But let me tell you another quick story. Pastor, I'm about as bad as you and I'll try to get done here. I'm in Denver, Colorado with my dear wife and we're soul winning. And we're trying to win somebody the Lord. We, we went out there to a soul winning class called Netcasters. And we were, we were trying to, we went out Monday night and nothing happened. It was Tuesday night. Monday night we got to go out and just listen to people. And Tuesday night it was our night to go. So I'm, I'm there knocking on doors. And I'm in an apartment building in Denver, Colorado. And I'm on the second floor. And I'm walking to this door and I go. And standing over there was a man smoking a cigarette. A big black man. And he said, what do you want? I said, oh, I'm just going in here. I'm from uh, church. We're just knocking, telling people about Jesus. And he says, that's my apartment. And he says, my wife's in there. She probably needs to listen to you go on in. <laughs> so I knocked on the door. And when we went on, went on in, my wife wasn't with me. Went on in there, and this lady was in there. And she got I got to talk to her. And she taught a one and went to a local Baptist church. And she was talking to me about it. And I said, oh, man, I'm trying to learn how to win somebody to the Lord. And, I'm just finding the same people. And she said, well, practice on me. So I did a netcaster net thing, and I was going through all the things. About halfway through, I looked, and the tears were starting to run down her face. And I said, ma'am, you're not saved, are you? And she says, no, but God had given me the provision of God. And I'd shared it with her. And I said, would you like to get saved right now? And she said, yes, sir, I would, but I'm afraid. She said, I'm afraid to pray. And I said, okay, let me pray first and you pray after. And I said, I don't have a problem with that if you believe what you're praying. If you honestly believe what you're praying, you can follow after me. So I said, I said, I'll pray first and you pray. I said, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. She says, oh, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And this big bass voice behind me said, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Her husband had walked in, heard the whole thing, and they both got saved. Listen, you want to get excited about serving God? You want to get, get excited about being his servant and things going on in your life? Understand, he's going with you. Understand, he'll protect you. Understand, he's giving you the provisions that you need. Let's hurry on. Go to John with me real quick. Like. John chapter 20. This is one you'll know. By the way, we're doing peas real good. You've noticed it's, uh, he's, got, he, he, he's going with me. What was it? Presence, I'll remember it in a second. And, pro, and, and uh, protection and provision. But in John chapter 20, in verse 19, he says, In the same day at evening, being the great day, being the first day of the week, when the doors were closed, where the disciples were assembled by fear of the Jews. You ever get scared? The disciples got scared. They're up there and they're scared. And Jesus came and stood unto them and said unto them, What did he say unto them? Peace be unto you. What did he promise them? Peace. God promises you peace. 
You want to go to bed at night knowing you've lived for God today? You want to go to bed at night knowing you're doing what God wants you to do today? You want to live a life that, that has more meaning to it than you'll ever have in your life when you realize that you've gone and you've told somebody about Jesus Christ and you can close your eyes that night saying, I did what God wanted me to do. And that peace that passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What a joy it is. What a wonderful blessing it is to have the peace of God in your heart and life. But it's only for those that don't. Well, let me give you one quick final one and I'll give you just... I used to do radio. I learned how to quit in a minute. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. But ye shall receive what? Oh! But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be with some me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. You see, God promises power. He promises if you'll go, he'll go before you. How many of you have ever saved anybody? He does the saving because he has the power. All power is given unto him in heaven and earth. He said that in Matthew chapter 28. And he promises he'll give you his power. His power will rest upon you. His power will take, take care of you. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. And I'm going to finish with this. He's standing there with his disciples. He's getting ready to go up, isn't he? It's the end of the 40 days. There's going to be 10 more days, and Pentecost is going to come. But he's getting ready to go up, and they look at him and say, Oh, Lord, tell us, when, when are you going to come? And he says, Not for you to know. The day of the seasons. And then he says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He promised us the power. Now, can I give you the secret why we're not getting things done? It's right here. He told them, You tarry in Jerusalem. You stay there for 10 days till the power comes. What's the key? What's, what happened there? Why did it happen? Why did all of it come together? Why did they have the presence of God? Why did they have the protection of God? Why did they have the, the uh, uh, provision of God? Why did they have the peace of God and the power of God? I'm going to tell you what it was, and it can happen at Bethel Baptist Church if we'll get our hearts right. They were with one accord. They put aside their pettiness. They put aside their personal ambitions. They put aside, I, don't, I sit over here because I don't like that person over there. They put aside this, that, and the other. They put aside their laziness. They put aside, they got on their knees and prayed for 10 days, and God gave them great power because they were all in one accord in one place. And it wasn't a honor. When a church gets in one accord, when a church recognizes the fact that we call that man to be our leader, and he's going to preach the word of God and stand on the things of God, but we have got to have one accord and be behind them. When they stood up there, only one man did the preaching, but read Acts chapter 2 very carefully. He was not alone. Yes, we heard Peter's message. They, people say we heard them speaking in our own tongue. And then it gives a list of these ones that heard, Pete, heard them in their own language. But it was because at least 120 people decided we're going to just believe God. And we're going to believe that he can do anything through us if we'll just be of one accord in one place. So what am I saying to you tonight? We're getting ready to have a mission conference. But we can have number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And we can go back ten years from now and say, well, we've had ten great mission conferences. But what are we doing? Let's, let's, let's tonight, let's decide. We're going to be one accord. We're going to get on fire for this. We're going to start praying for this right now, tonight. We're going to bathe it in prayer before Wednesday. We're going to get on our faces in the morning, read our Bibles every day. We're going to, Lord, bless the mission conference. Bless the preachers. Bless what's going on. Stir my heart. Touch my heart. Make things different at Bethel Baptist Church. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm laying out my heart to you tonight because this is my first time to preach and he told me he might fire me. <laughs> so I better get my shot in while I can. I just want to see this place grow. I want to follow this pastor. 
I want to see God bless the ministry here. I want to see the smile come on your faces and the amens come out of your lives. And I want to see people walk down the aisles here and get saved because they can get saved and they're, they're, out, there, they're out there dying every day. And the 156,000 people went off to be in eternity today. And there's people out there that need to hear about Jesus. And they need to hear it in Bethel Baptist Church. Because we are going to go. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's try that again. Amen? Amen. 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 Precious promises. Heavenly Father, Lord, you see my heart tonight. Oh, Lord, missions are so important. But we're missionaries, Lord. Each and every one of us are missionaries. Use us this week. Give us a prayer time and a unity and a, a cord that brings a church together. Helps us to just be ready to serve you with all our heart and soul. And have your will and way. And bless tonight. Bless the invitation tonight. Bless the week. Guide and direct, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Has God dealt with your heart? Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, I'll go. Yes, Lord, I'll tell my neighbor. Yes, Lord, I'll get my heart right with you. Yes, Lord, I want to see God bless Bethel Baptist Church. Yes, I believe you have promises for me. And they're for me. Claim the promises of God. Only trust Him. You know, there's a fear in a lot of Baptists that if they go up to in front when a man gives the invitation, somebody's going to say, I wonder what was wrong with them. Oh, maybe they just want to get right with God. God's dealt with your heart, you come. God's dealt with you, there's still time to come. Only trust Him. trusting him. He will save you. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you got sin in your life. Whatever God's doing. trust him. We got some people down here still, so we're going to continue for a second. It's only five minutes after seven. Sunday night, you got plenty of time. Let's let God do a work. Is he touching your heart? When's the last time you just really got right with God? When's the last time you felt the presence of Jesus Christ? When's the last time you understood the protection, the provision, the wonderful peace that passes understanding? And above all, when's the last time you knew that you had the power of God? you all a question while pastor's praying here. Do you long for God to do something in this church? Do you long to see God do something special? Let's start praying about it. 
He can do it and He will do it. God is able. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm, I told Pastor he can't come up here today because I got special stuff to do with him and I get to do it. Are you all ready? We're going to all sing happy birthday to our pastor. And then, after we sing happy birthday to our pastor, we're going to have ice cream and things in the, auto, in the, in the gymnasium. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to go over there and celebrate his birthday. If you don't want to, that's okay. <laughs> I'll use any excuse to eat ice cream. I'll do anything to eat ice cream, preacher. Amen. Okay, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Next door, you 